And the answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. God is filling with adrenaline right now. Whether you know it or not. The heart's beating fast. It's giving a little harder to breathe. The neurobiological system is telling it to run. But your knees are too weak to move. Fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is mere insanity. Do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslivism.com. 100% listener supported radio. Reporting to danger. Unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution Radio! The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen, for another episode of Cosmic Catastrophe. I am your host, Diamond, from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, and Sacred Geography over on YouTube. And today we are going to bring you another tantalizing episode of Scientific Information to Make Your Skin Crawl. Now, over the last five weeks, we've been talking about cosmic catastrophes in the form of cometary impact. We focused in for four weeks on the Younger Dryas uh, impact hypothesis, and we may delve back into that. And we also co covered the Hopewell airburst event, which essentially eliminated the mound builders around 400 AD. But today we have another chapter in our cosmic catastrophe saga, and it's going to be talking about none other than more asteroid impact. Uh, now, did an asteroid impact cause an ancient tsunami in recent history? Well, in antiquity, and I'm talking about 12, 2807 BC. Many of you may uh, register this date as potentially being the flood of Noah, of Noah's time. And we'll get into that a little later in the podcast. But the reason we're bringing this up is because a group of scientists about a decade ago, uh, I don't, we'll get to their name in just a second, but they found some huge Chevron formations and Chevron formations are kind of like V shaped. And we're going to bring this up here for the viewers on the video. Now the question is, did an asteroid impact cause an ancient tsunami 2807 BC? And well, yes, it might have. And in fact, here we are looking at some of that evidence in Madagascar. Now, at the southern end of Madagascar lie four enormous web wedge-shaped sediment deposits called chevrons. Now, these are comprised of material from the ocean floor, deep ocean floor, and they're now up on land. Each of these chevrons covers twice the area of Manhattan with sediment as deep as the Chrysler building is high. So this is quite substantial. And on close inspection, the Chevron deposits contain deep ocean microfossils that are fused with a medley of metals typically formed by cosmic impacts. And all of them point in the same direction towards the middle of the Indian Ocean, where a newly discovered crater 
18 miles in diameter, lies 12,500 feet below the surface. And this is none other than Burkle Crater. And we'll get to some of the scientific papers and the discoveries in recent years about that impact structure and how they even located it. They located it based on these large chevron dunes, which are located all around the Indian Ocean. And in fact, if you start at Burkle Crater and you move perpendicular away from it towards Western Australia or Western India or Eastern Madagascar, you're going to find these chevrons up high up on land with deep sea deposits and cometary, well, impact markers and even some fused metals that we just heard about. Now, the explanation is obvious to some scientists that a large asteroid or comet, the kind that could kill a quarter of the world's population, smashed into the Indian Ocean 4,800 years ago. And it produced a tsunami at least 600 feet high. That's a pretty, that's a pretty substantial tsunami. Now, we've seen tsunamis 10 times smaller than that in our lifetime, but this 600-foot high tsunami would be a big one. Now, recently, there have been tsunamis bigger than this, but they're very localized and usually in areas that are uninhabited. And we may get to some of that data in the show, so stay tuned. So this tsunami that Burkle Crater would have created 4,800 years ago is about 13 times as big as the one that inundated in Indonesia uh, nearly two years ago. Now, this wave carried the huge deposits of sediment to land, the chevrons, the ones that are as high as the Chrysler building and the size of Manhattan. Now, most astronomers doubt that any large comets or asteroids have crashed into the Earth in the last 10,000 years. But the self-described band of misfits that make up the Holocene Impact Working Group say that astronomers simply have not known how or where to look for evidence of such impacts along the world's shorelines and in the deep ocean. Well, and not only that, there are papers dealing with these impacts in peer-reviewed studies. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. And it might blow your mind. Now, scientists in the Holocene Impact Working Group say the evidence for such impacts during the last 10,000 years, known as the Holocene epoch, is strong enough to overturn current estimates of how often Earth suffers violent impacts on the order of 10 megaton explosions. Instead of it happening once in 500,000 to a million years, as astronomers now calculate, catastrophic impacts could happen every thousand years at a scale of 10 megatons. And this, well, this not only would be empire ending, but it would be catastrophic to the planet as a whole. Now, the researchers who form the working group after finding one another through an international conference are now based in the US, Australia, Russia, France, and Ireland. They are established experts in geology, geophysics, geomorphology, tsunamis, tree rings, soil science, and even archaeology, and including the structural analysis of myth. Now, this is important because many of the myths that are from around the world are actual historic accounts of things that happened in the past that may have been hard or impossible to describe with the current nomenclature, and therefore the myth. Now, we're going to talk about some of this evidence, and it's mind-blowing. So buckle up. I hope you're ready. And we're going to tie this all back together with the flood of Noah. Well, and the reduction of the population on Earth 4,800 years ago by 25% in an instant. Now, there has been a comprehensive historical tsunami database, and it was collected at the Novosibirsk Tsunami Lab, 
and it contains more than 2,250 historical tsunamis in the world oceans. 2,250 historical tsunamis in the world oceans from 1628 BC to present. That's just 3,600 years of time. We've had 2,250 tsunamis. So if you do the math there, about every 1.2 years, there's a tsunami. That's pretty often. And we've seen some pretty big catastrophic tsunamis in our lifetime. So 2,250 historical tsunamis in the world oceans from 1628 BC to present. And even the historical data set is incomplete for many areas, especially for older times. The world catalog contains enough data to estimate average run-up heights for the largest seismically induced tsunamis that caused widespread damage and many fatalities. And this happened in 1755 in Lisbon, in 1868, in 1877 in Chile, and in 1952 in Kamchatka, as well as 1957 in the Aleutians, and another major tsunami 1960 in Chile, and the 1964 Alaska tsunami, and the 2005 Sumatra tsunami. This average run-up does not exceed 30 to 35 meters on the nearest coast, with 10 to 12 meters at the distance of more than 5,000 kilometers. Now, somewhat larger waves, up to 40 to 45 meters, can be generated by volcanic explosions, followed by volcanic cone collapses, such as what happened during Santorini in 1628 BC, and Kuwe in 1453, Unzen in 1792, Tambora in 1815, and Krakatau in 1883. These all had large waves up to 45 meters high that were generated by volcanic explosions followed by volcanic cone collapse. And so what you do is have a massive landslide that rushes into the ocean and displaces huge amounts of water. Now these pale in comparison to let's say um, the La Palma scenario where an entire island would literally shear off. The La Palma slides go out into the ocean for miles in some cases. We even covered some major landslides that happen in Hawaii. Some of the biggest landslides on earth are on the flanks of the Hawaiian islands. And that's simply because how large they are and how high they sit off the seafloor. <clears throat> so, we have lots of different types of tsunamis, and there's even bigger tsunamis. Landslide, gener landslide generated tsunamis, which I was just discussing like in La Palma, have the largest recorded heights. And some of them have been calculated to up to 525 meters. That is quite a bit of feet, almost 2,000 feet high. But normally these events are very local with the width of the inundated area from just hundreds of meters to several kilometers. And this includes 1958, 1936, and 1853, Lutuya Bay, and 1936, Norway, and 2000 in Greenland. There were tsunamis up to 525 meters high. That's mind boggling. Can you even imagine being on the shore and watching that come to you? What would your thoughts be? Well, I would think you would be praying <laughs> or preparing to hold your breath. Now, meanwhile, many parts of the world ocean coastlines contain prominent features of catastrophic impact of water currents and waves that come from the ocean. They are large boulders weighing well above 100 tons lying on the top of vertical cliffs at a height of up to 60 meters. And large vortexes cut down in rather resistive coastal rocks. This is all evidence 
of tsunami washout. And on the smaller scale, some of these features include sculpted bedrocks, grooves, canyons, cavetos, and flutes found in areas where hurricanes and severe tropical storms are not common. Therefore, they need another explanation on how they got there. Now, sedimentary features of water impacts include mega ripples, which are found in the northwestern Australia, and so-called chevrons, or parabolic and blade-like shaped sand dunes, some of which we just talked about in Madagascar, that are the size of Manhattan and the height of the Chrysler building. And many of these are common along many parts of the Indian Ocean coast. And like we just reiterated in southern Madagascar, chevrons reach an altitude of 205 meters with 30 to 45 kilometers of inland penetration. And if you just get out Google Earth and look at the southern tip of Madagascar, blow it up, it'll become very obvious what we're talking about. A high energy water flux of that scale could be generated by Storega class submarine landslides or Santorini class volcanic explosions. But for this area, does not have nearby active volcanoes or large sedimentary basins with the potential for large volume submarine sliding. Now, not widely acknowledged presently, but still a real possibility is the creation of these coastal features by catastrophic ocean waves generated by deep water impacts of large comets or asteroids. And do you see how we just circled back? Now, in the Indian Ocean, several crater candidates, including Burkle, Mahuika, Kukla, and Christie, have been found recently by geomorphological analysis of detailed bathymetric maps. And I'm sure those studies are continuing. All of these craters are geologically young. And analysis of nearby deep sea cores show the presence of some elements and minerals typical of oceanic impact structures. Now, the paper we're looking at now discusses the consistency of the data using spatial and azimuthal distribution of these large-scale erosional and sedimentary features that are found at the Australian and Madagascar coast. And so there's different forms of sculpted bedrock along the southeastern Australian coast. They're believed to be a result of cavitation and or impact of high velocity water currents. And then there's vortex structures along the Australian southeast coast. These are very similar. Both of these structures are similar to giant potholes that can be found all over where the glacial outwash occurred in the west here which are definitely not forming from the current rivers and streams that flow in the valleys, these giant potholes exist, which suggests that those rivers at one time were 10 times deeper, faster, and stronger. And so the same evidence here, giant potholes or vortex structures along the Australian Southeast coast suggest the same thing, that they are believed to be carved into these resistant coastal rocks by water currents with velocities greater than 10 meters per second and depths of greater than five meters, which also explains cavitation. And then there's the big one that we'll get into in more detail after the break, the giant Chevron dunes from different coastlines of the world, especially surrounding the Indian Ocean. Now, these chevrons 
or dunes, V-shaped dunes, can reach heights of more than 100 meters with inland penetration up to 10 kilometers and are believed to be the result of impact of destructive ocean waves with possible later modification by wind. Now, if you take a world map and you orient the Chevron dunes at all the locations, some of them start to point to some of these impact structures, like Burkle Crater, Kuklu, Mahuika, and I'm saying these all incorrectly. But when you have impact structures that occurred in the ocean, what happens on the shoreline surrounding these structures is typically indicative of huge tsunamis. Mega tsunamis in the world oceans as being as common as occurring every few hundred or thousand years. 600 meter high tsunamis. And the evidence is piling up. There's Chevron dune formation, micro ejecta, and even rapid climate change during the time of these impacts as evidence of recent bolide impacts. And so we're simply following the team as they gain more information. This paper in 2010 on mega tsunamis of the world oceans adds more data to what we just talked about, including all of those interesting structures. Now, specifically, what we're going to get into in the second half is talking about Noah's flood, the flood of Noah, and the fact that Burkle Crater may be responsible for such a flood. Now, one of the more recent papers <clears throat> deals with the physical and environmental effects that would result from this oceanic impact by a sizable comet and the rates and risks associated with such cosmic impacts, which we're learning may be more frequent than was once thought. It may happen in our lifetime. Now, this paper specifically investigates two sets of probable oceanic impact events that occurred within the last 5,000 years. Now, up until this point, no one thought there was any cometary impacts in oceans or otherwise since the Younger Dryas impact event. But now that time frame is shifting to much shorter and shorter intervals. And in this new paper, the team of scientists investigate two sets of probable oceanic impact events that occurred within the last 5,000 years. And one of them is in the middle of the Indian Ocean, about 2800 BC. Exactly the time of Noah. Which I believe can be dated specifically and will blow your mind in the second half with the actual date and time of Noah's flood and why many scientists have come up with that date and time. And so there is another oceanic impact within the last 5,000 years in the Gulf of Carpentaria in Australia. And that's even more recent. This is AD 536, so just about 1,500 years ago. And if either of these impacts, oceanic bolide, are validated, they would be the most energetic natural catastrophes occurring during the middle to late Holocene ever recorded with large scale environmental and historic human effects and consequences. Now, not only that, they might clear up some of the confusion with Noah's flood, which is specifically dated to 2807 BC. And many people confuse it with the Younger Dryas impact, mass extinction, and flood. 
But if you're listening to the channel, there have been many floods. And according to the tsunami data, there has been a major tsunami every 1.2 years for the last 3,000 years. Some of them 500 meters high, which would certainly appear to be biblical to the people that are experiencing it. But there is only one Noah's flood, and it very well may be the impact from Burkle Crater. All right, so the physical evidence for these two impacts consist of several sets of data. The first set are remarkable depositional traces of coastal flooding in dunes. The giant Chevron dunes that we just told you everyone was locating as soon as Google Earth came out. And I implore you all to get out your Google Earth and start looking at the coastline around the Indian Ocean, Western India, Western Australia, and Eastern Madagascar and Southern Madagascar and get familiar with what some of these look like. And I'll pull up Google Earth for the, our video watchers and just uh, after the break, and we will show some of those pictures. But, oh, and there is the break. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Stay tuned. That's a boom. you. If you're not in control, then someone else is. Join me, Ivy West, for Voices on the Wind, Saturday. I discuss government, health, metaphysics, suppressed science, universal mysteries, little-known incredible facts, alternative energies, and even more than you can imagine. That was blood on the wire. Won't you join us on Revolution Radio Saturdays, for Voices on the Wind, with me, Ivy West. There are lives in the balance, people under fire, children at the cannons. There are because if your head's in the sand, your tail is a target. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the internet. Please help support this station so this battle can continue forward. Revolution, Revolution. Radio! Join me and the Brian Rue Show on Revolution Radio, Eastern Standard Time, every Tuesday night from 6 to 8. We talk about the four most vital things, in my view, affecting all of humanity. Number one is UFOs and aliens and their agenda for the advancement of humanity. Number two is the Jewish establishment's control over all aspects of human civilization. Number three, the truth about Adolf Hitler, how he was the opposite of what we've been told Number four is Advanced Ancient Global Civilizations. Join me on The Brian Rue Show, Tuesday nights from 6 to 8 on Studio B on Revolution Radio. Thank 
Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Any commercial advertising you may hear in this program is of the sole discretion and benefit of the host of whose program you are listening to. Revolution Radio does not endorse any commercial products, nor does it accept monetary compensation for on-air advertising of commercial products, nor will it ever. We are and shall remain 100% listener supported. Any product advertising on this program are considered used at higher risk, and Revolution Radio shall not be held liable for any claims or damages received from any product advertised within this program. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. We are back for the second half of Cosmic Catastrophe, and today we are discussing potentially connecting Burkle Crater with the flood of Noah and why many scientists are leaning toward Well, what we have pulled up here, which you can't see in Radio Land, is the Indian Ocean here in Africa, and we're going to show some of those features in just a moment, but let's go over what they are. So over the last decade and a half, scientists have been looking since the advent of Google Earth around the coastlines of Earth and finding gigantic structures. And these structures appear to be huge washovers from mega tsunamis that carried material miles and miles inland and hundreds of feet upwards and even placed 10 and 100 ton blocks up to 180 feet on the top of a cliff. So all this evidence is suggesting that these mega tsunamis are quite, well, are more common than we once thought. And that is pretty scary. Now, some of the data includes remarkable depositional traces of coastal flooding in the form of the giant Chevron dunes. They're found in Southern Madagascar along the coast of the Gulf of Carpentaria. The presence of crater candidates, including Burkle Crater, which is about 1,500 kilometers southeast of Madagascar, with dates to within the last 6,000 years. And the 18-kilometer Kanamari, the 12-kilometer Taban craters with estimated ages of AD 572. So there were mega tsunamis happening as recent as 1,500 years ago, but the flood of Noah from 29-kilometer Burkle crater 29 kilometer that's the largest crater out of any of these recent craters and that is in the directly in the middle of the indian ocean which would send uh, a mega tsunami around the periphery of that smashing into well the likes of western india western australia eastern madagascar and parts of east africa and all of this information is being backed up by the presence of quench textured magnetite spherules, nearly pure carbon spherules, teardrop shaped tectites with trails of ablation and even vitreous material found by cutting edge laboratory analytical techniques. And so these craters are pretty much confirmed to be craters that produced mega tsunamis. Now, do we have modern evidence of mega tsunamis? Yes, and let's go over a little bit about that before we tie it all together with NOAA. Back in 1958, Latuya Bay earthquake occurred on July 9th at 1215 Pacific Standard Time with a moment magnitude of 7.8 to 8.3 and a maximum Mercalli intensity of 11 which is extreme. Now, the strike slip earthquake took place on the Fairweather Fault and triggered a rock slide of 30 million cubic meters. That's a lot. And about 90 million tons into the narrow inlet at Latuya Bay, Alaska. The impact was heard 80 kilometers away. That's 50 miles. 
and the sudden displacement of water resulted in a mega tsunami that washed out trees to a maximum elevation of 1,720 feet. This was at the entrance of Gilbert Inlet. This is the largest and most significant mega tsunami in modern times and just happened 60 years ago. It forced a reevaluation of large wave events and the recognition of impact events, rock falls and landslides as causes of very large waves. That's insane. The sudden displacement of water resulted in a mega tsunami that washed out trees to an elevation of 524 meters. 1,720 feet high was stripped of vegetation. That's how high the wave was. Or the wash up. Either way, it's insane. So if this can happen this recently, what would happen if a three kilometer piece of rock smashed into the middle of the ocean? And one big enough to form Berkel Crater, probably be about three or four kilometers. And would have to go through 12,500 feet of ocean on its way to the bottom before impact. Can you even fathom that? Pushing a hole two and a half miles deep into the ocean, what size wave that would create? So let's talk about Berkel Crater and Noah's Flood. Madagascar provides the smoking gun for geologically recent impacts, and we've covered them over the last 30 minutes or so, including the giant chevrons in the deep ocean. And so how do we tie it all together? Well, we've come full circle back to the Holocene Impact Working Group and the group of scientists from around the world, Australia, France, Ireland, and Russia, who have hypothesized that meteorite impacts on Earth are more common than previously supposed. And although... Berkel Crater has not been radiometrically dated. The Holocene Impact Working Group suggests it was formed between 2800 and 3000 BC. And I'm sure there is dating and analysis going on right now on the topic. So Bruce Massey, an environmental archaeologist at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico thinks that he can say precisely when this comet fell that created Berkel Crater. And according to Massey, he says that the comet fell on the morning of May 10th, 2807 BC. Noah's flood. You see, Dr. Massey or Mass analyzed 175 flood myths from around the world. And he tried to relate them to known and accurately dated natural events like solar eclipses and volcanic eruptions. And among other evidence, he said that 14 flood myths specifically mention a full solar eclipse, which could have been the one that occurred May 2807 BC. And half of these myths talk about torrential downpours, according to Dr. Massey. A third of them talk of giant tsunami. And worldwide, they describe hurricane force winds and darkness during the storm. Now, all of these could be generated from a mega tsunami especially one created by a four kilometer bolide that pushes its way down 12,500 feet of Indian Ocean to smash into the bottom of the seafloor. The amount of evaporated seawater and the subsequent weather patterns and clouds would be devastating and would last for days. 
of course, extraordinary claims like this require extraordinary proof. And since 2007, scientists have been working on uncovering that extraordinary proof. And we're not there yet, but we are certainly picking it apart. But nonetheless, the size of the chevrons and their position do show high water that came in that area. And they can give an assessment to how high it should be elsewhere. Now this, when this occurred was an era when clay tablets were the height of literacy communication. So it's hardly surprising that no record of scientific measurements or explain without reference exists. Because many of the people that may have witnessed it may have perished. And anyone who has seen records of battles as late as the Middle Ages will know that records rarely accurately assessed how many men were in the armies. And that is something that kings and their scribes must have known and have had a deep personal interest in. So lack of decisive records is no surprise because they just weren't kept. Now the dating specifically to the morning of May 10th, 2807 BC seems enthusiastic. But similar mentions of an eclipse when Odysseus returned home have been used to date the Odyssey. And we are at that stage with this crater, Burkle Crater, that we were with the dinosaur killer crater that was first hypothesized by Dr. Alvarez on the basis of just finding a geologic layer of iridium. And shortly thereafter, Guess what? We found the impact structure. Right on the northern tip of the Yucatan Peninsula in the Gulf of Mexico. Where an even larger rock hit the Gulf of Mexico 64 million years ago. killing off 65% of all life on earth in a mere instant. So if you want to take some time and blow your mind, just come out to the middle of the Indian Ocean. You're going to see some, some ridges. You're going to see Madagascar. And if you just zoom in on the southern tip of Madagascar, the first thing that you're going to see are these white strips which look like beaches that extend inland. And these are the features. These features, this sand is blasted inland for miles. Here's a, a case we're looking at where the sand comes in for 30 or 40 miles, forming these massive chevron dunes, which are clearly not formed due to wind. They're hundreds of feet high. And all of the features on this coastline all point in the same direction. And that's what gives us the evidence that this all formed from the same event. All of these wash chins along the coast of Madagascar all point to the same spot out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, Burkle Crater. Now, here's the unfortunate thing. Well, let's talk about the, the Noah and the flood myth. If you start at Burkle Crater, which is just about a thousand miles east of the southern tip of Madagascar, and it washed away all the civilization on the west coast of Australia, the east coast of Madagascar, it even smashed into Dwarka that area, and rushed up towards Ur in Iraq. The Gulf of Aden would have been penetrated, and all of the Fertile Crescent would have been inundated by what would appear to have been a massive flood because this mega tsunami would have to work its way up and into these waterways. 
it would literally not look like a breaking wave, but more like a 600 foot high wall of water. And the only way to survive it would be to be in a boat. A boat that didn't break up as the water smashed into you. One that was covered maybe bobbed up to the top like a bobber. These massive evidence of massive flooding occurs on all the coastlines in this region. Here we could see more wash up here, which points back down to the direction of the mega tsunami in Somalia. You could see it in Yemen. Massive floods smashed into here and washed back out. And it probably destroyed, well, if we think about it, over 60% of all the population on Earth currently is on the coast. And if a mega tsunami were to occur in the middle of the Pacific, the loss of life would be catastrophic. Maybe approaching 1 billion people dead in 24 hours. And then you have the environmental effects of what these mega tsunamis would provide. We just take Burkle Crater, a 29 kilometer impact feature, probably a four kilometer wide rock traveling at ridiculous velocities, penetrating two and a half miles of Indian Ocean to hit the seafloor. The volume of ocean water that would vaporize is unimaginable and would create a hellstorm, a deluge. It would darken the skies. It may even block out the sun for a period with that much moisture up in the atmosphere. Certainly locally, maybe even regionally, potentially globally, at least a, he a hemisphere would be affected. So this is when we have to start considering why does the human population have such amnesia? We have all the myths of the great catastrophes. We have the geologic evidence. We have the paleontological evidence of mass extinction. The last great mass extinction was just 12,800 and 90 years ago, during the Younger Dryas event. And we've pinpointed that beryllium spike to a specific year. So it's not like the data doesn't exist. And here, using the tsunami studies and mythology, it's becoming evident that comets and large objects hit the Earth all the time every few hundred, if not thousand years, and cause mega tsunamis up to 600 meters high that could circumnavigate an entire ocean, smashing into all the continents surrounding. There would be no preparation for this. And if there was warning, the warning would kill many people simply because of the hysteria created. Do you think it's easy to escape Mumbai or a city like Jakarta? If a 600 meter wave is coming at Jakarta, there's nowhere to go. You'd have to get up on a mountain real quick, a high one, a volcano, which may be erupting. And the travel time for these tsunamis would be rapid. It would be a matter of hours because the impact would be so severe, the wave would be propagated at extremely high speeds. It would splinter entire cities. If there were an impact in the Atlantic Ocean, near the east coast of the US, or even in the center, it would rush towards Long Island, Cape Cod, 
The entire island of Long Island is barely above sea level. Every single human being would perish in an instant. And it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And once you know this information, living on the coast makes it, well, you just don't have peace of mind, do you? So I always say it's a great, Florida is a great state to visit. But in the event of anything major happening as far as an impact in the ocean or a tsunami that's generated by a large earthquake or landslide, there's no escape. Unless you have scuba gear and a lot of air. So there are ways to survive, like a pod, a sub submersible you could get into. So when the wave hit, you would just bob up to the top. But this, again, is a very rare, in a lifetime, a human lifetime of, let's say, 80 years, you know, the chances are pretty low that this is going to happen. And that's what the people on the west coast of Florida said right before Hurricane Ian flooded their homes to 10 feet. You know, it hadn't happened for decades. People forgot. They didn't remember. They become complacent. And maybe the ancients did too. Because the megalithic builders didn't make it. Or very few of them did. Whatever happened to the Clovis people completely changed them. And archaeologists named them Folsom. They were eliminated from the west coast of the United States completely and the east coast. And those that survived in the plains had to create new technology because the animals were different. And back during the flood of Noah, well, like we said, there are 14 different versions of that from around the world. And most of them are surrounding, yes, the Indian Ocean, where the impact occurred. Burkle Crater created Noah's flood. Now, how could Noah have known it was coming? Maybe the comet was visible. And I haven't looked into any of the mythology to see if we can corroborate that. But the stories of what happened during Noah's flood, including the darkening of the skies and the inundation by rain, Scientifically, all can be explained by impact in the Indian Ocean and the mega tsunami created. So it's, it's time, I think, we delve a little deeper. And we're going to look at the more recent impact structure next week. So we already know that mega tsunamis occur. The 1958 Latuya Bay earthquake washed all of the trees off of the landscape up to 1,720 feet high. I wish I had a webcam there that day. <laughs> I'm sure many people do. So there was another impact in a mega tsunami which occurred just 1,500 years ago, and we'll delve into that one next week. Guys, if you don't know, Revolution Radio is the number one listener-supported internet radio on the planet. It wouldn't be on the air without the support of listeners like you. So go over to freedomslips.com and support Revolution Radio, where... As long as we follow FCC guidelines, we can pretty much say anything we want. And we believe we're getting closer and closer to pinpointing the flood of Noah as being a local event. 
It only affected Africa and Asia and Australia and Antarctica. North America and South America were spared. Maybe the mega tsunami could have hit the southern tip of South America, but for the most part, Greenland, the European side, unaffected by Noah's flood. And this is slowly being proven by science. Will a mega tsunami happen in our lifetime? Well, the last one is about 1,500 years ago, so the probability is very high that at any moment, and it'll probably happen during a meteor shower, like the Torrids. Thankfully, those have passed, and only very small bolides entered this year. They make great for news stories, but when the big one hits the ocean, will we know? Do we have enough instruments to catch it? Will there be enough warning? If you live in a big city on the coast, up in a high rise on the 80th floor, and you have six hours to get 100 miles inland and 1,000 feet high, you probably won't make it. Well, and that is just the unfortunate nature of cosmic catastrophe. But the beautiful thing is, some of us always make it, no matter how extreme. Over the last several million years, hominids, humans, just like us, are still here. And we're surviving. And we're thriving albeit in, in a dystopian world. But we will make it. Thanks for listening. We love you. Be safe. We'll see you next week. Hello, my name is Mr. Rowe. I am the host of Reality Extraction, the Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I utilize logic, intellect, and magic to methodically autonomize, vivisect, analyze, examine, study, scrutinize, and extract an essence of reality from a fog of illusion and confusion. You can find me on Studio B every Thursday, 1700 hours Pacific Time, that's 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic taboo, no subject too strange. I strive to take a neutral standpoint during the dissection of the topic at hand. That's Reality Extraction with Mr. Row on Revolution Radio. Join me at Revolution Radio, Studio B, at 11 a.m. on Saturday for free association.